Say this with me. It is our custom to remind ourselves what preaching is all about. Say this. We are loving the Word, and we are learning the Word so that we can live the Word. Father, speak to us this morning. We take every thought into captivity, Lord, so that we might hear from heaven, and we might receive fresh manna, bread from, from, the, from the grace of God. Speak to us today and encourage us. We thank you for it in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen, amen. Still the church. We are still the church. I will build my church, Jesus said, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, look at this church. It's a beautiful facility. It's a wonderful facility. Ten or eleven, I haven't walked it lately, ten or eleven acres of land. We are, we are blessed in this church. And Jesus said, I will build my church. Now, was he talking about this church? No and yes. No, because he wasn't just talking about this church. He was talking about his church, right? The church of the 1500s and the 1200s and the church that is to come. But understand this. When he said, I'll build my church, he was also talking about the church at Ephesus and the church at Colossae and the church of Thessalonica and the church in Belleville and the church in Collinsville and every particular church in Collinsville. So he was certainly also talking about revive. Somebody say amen. Jesus said, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Let's look at some more scripture about this amazing entity, this living organism called the church of Jesus Christ that you are blessed to be a part of. Ephesians 3, though I am the least deserving of all God's people. Now, let's stop right there for a moment. And is it possible that God used Paul because he was so humble? <laughs> I think it is very possible that God used Paul because he wasn't always tooting his own horn and saying, I'm the greatest. In fact, he often said, I'm the least. Here he's saying it again. Though I'm the least deserving of all God's people, he graciously gave me the privilege of telling the Gentiles, that's everybody that's not a Jew, about the endless treasures available to them in Christ. Do you realize there's endless treasures available to you in Christ? Oh, somebody said, God, open my eyes to see. God, open my ears to hear. Endless treasures available to me in Christ. See, Paul says, I was chosen to explain to everyone this mysterious plan that God the creator of all things had kept secret from the beginning. God's purpose, now I want you to catch this. I want you to, to put aside the iPhone and put aside the grocery list and, and, and just, just focus, pay attention. God's purpose in all of this was to use the church. Raise your hand if you're in the church. Raise your other hand if you're part of the church. Uh, wave them around if you know what it means that you are graced by the blood of Christ to be a part of the church. God's purpose in all of this was to use the church to have a little escape from the nasty world. We can all get together and sing fun songs and forget about the darkness around us for a few minutes on a Sunday morning. That's God's ultimate purpose, isn't it? No. God's purpose in all of this was to use the church to display his wisdom in its rich variety to all the unseen rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. Oh, what a calling, what a charge, what a privilege, what an honor it is to know that you are part of the church that God has chosen to display his infinite wisdom to all the forces of all the principalities and powers over this region. Now, if you can see that you are part of something bigger 
than what we're experiencing, then you ought to make it out to the next prayer meeting because you want to say, God, we want this church to begin to demonstrate to the principalities and power your awesome wisdom, revelation, and knowledge that God is building his church. Somebody say glory to God. Now, see, you're in the church. You're part of the church, not just because you're saved. Of course, that's the only way you get in the church. I didn't say attend a church. I say get in the church. If you're born again, you're in the church. And you're in the church to be part of God's marvelous plan to demonstrate his wisdom and knowledge. Now, in this same chapter, go down to verse 20, Ephesians 3. It's the same, we're talking about the same issue here. What is a church for? Now, all glory to God, all glory to God, who is able through his mighty power at work within us. This is something God does in us. Got to catch that. To accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. Why? (laughs) What for? (laughs) Why is all this big stuff supposed to be going on? To him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. Amen. Listen to me. Christ has come to build a kingdom and a church. That's it. He didn't promise to build a hospital or an educational system or a political system. He said, I will build my church, and I'm building it so that the demonic forces in this heavens, in the world around us, in the heavenly realm, will see the wisdom of God. And I'm building it so I have a place to show my glory. Somebody's going to get this this morning. I'm building my church so that I have a place to show my glory. Now, some of you just were on vacation. Oh, isn't it wonderful? I, my bucket list is the Grand Canyon. i got to see the Grand Canyon. I'm told it's breathtaking. It's like awesome. And I love watching birds in flight and, and uh, the fish swim in the lake behind my house. I am awed by the, the glory that is revealed in nature. But you know that that is only a, 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 a little portion of the glory we should be seeing. Where should we be seeing the glory of God manifested, the wisdom of God manifested? In the church, in the body, in the family of God. And in order for us to make that happen, we've got to bear on one another's burdens. You see, we are our brother's keeper, aren't we? The Bible says that. And the greatest churches, the most powerful churches, are the churches that care for one another and watch out for one another. I need a couple of volunteers this morning. Guys that are a little out on the edge and don't, you know, a guy like Pastor Alvin would be a good choice. And a guy like Jim Gray, Jim Gray, Jim Gray Jr., come come on. Come come right up here. I need your help. Cause because I want to show you something. And I need and right up here, guys. Right, right. Both of you stand beside each other. Look out this way. Very good. We gotta care for one another. We gotta watch each other's butts. Now, I know I'm in Canada, I know I'm in America. I can say that if I was in Canada, you have to say bottoms. But you're American, so you can you can handle this. We got to watch out for each other. We we got to watch each other's butts. Now, <clears throat> the illustration is of a guys that were going on their first mountain climbing trip, and their mountain climbing instructor said to them, "Now, before we get to the base of this mountain, I want you to I want to show you something." we got to watch each other's butts. They said, okay, whatever. They said, no, one of you get down on your, on your knees. Get down on your knees, Pastor Alvin. And I'll, I'll face this way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you turn around in front of them. No, the other way, the other way. Yeah, exactly. And he said, what I want you to do is grab the guy's butt and push hard. And they all looked like Pastor Alvin did, like, What? 
He said, no, you got to grab the guy's butt and push away. Push. Go ahead. Do it. Go ahead. Grab his butt and push away. Two, two hands. Butt. Grab his butt. Just, just grab his butt and push. That's all you can do. Just, just push. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. Now, because you were so hesitant, we're going to try that again. Back up a little closer. Grab the guy's butt and push. Good, good, good. Okay, and you did it about 20 times. And now reverse, okay, of course. You, you get to stand up and uh, he said, now he said, grab the guy's butt and push. Uh, that was his back. Okay, that was his back. <laughs> grab the guy's butt and push. There you go. Thanks, guys. They did that so great, didn't they? Thanks. And they switched out, and everybody did it, and what are we doing this? What are we doing this for? And they got to the edge of the mountain. He said, let me tell you why. Because you're going to go up this mountain. Somebody's butt's going to be in your face. And if he slips and starts coming back at you, you better be comfortable with grabbing his butt and pushing forward. Because if you don't, he's going to die, you're going to die, and everybody behind you is going to die too. If we're not comfortable taking care of one another and calling one another and texting one another and emailing one another and dropping in to visit to say, you know what blesses me as a pastor? When I hear somebody saying, I need somebody's phone number because I haven't seen them last week and I wonder how they're doing and I want to give them a call. That's watching each other's backsides. That's caring for one another. Because I don't know how long you've served the Lord, but I know it's possible to be ahead of someone and start to slip a little bit and start to lose your footing. It can be discouragement. It could be pain. It could be hurt. It could be weariness. It could be just getting fed up to here and you don't want to care anymore and you need somebody that's going to grab your butt and push you back on the solid ground. Can somebody say glory to God? That's what the church is for. That's what I'm for. That's what you're for. We got to care for one another. We got to get involved and bless one another. Now, after 83 years we are still the church. And let me give you even something bigger to shout about. After 2,000 years, we are still the church. Now that's something to celebrate. That's something to make some noise about. In fact, the Bible says, uh, make a joyful noise to the Lord on the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. I wonder what a joyful noise sounds like. Somebody make a joyful noise. You know, that's better than I thought you'd do. But I'm going to give you some help anyhow. Ushers, if you, if you come down here, and uh, the Bible says make a joyful noise to the Lord. So I'm going to give you some noisemakers, okay? This is a party. We get cupcakes later. Is it iced tea that's going with them? Iced tea. So everybody grab a noisemaker. And what you do with these is you put your lips around it and you blow hard, Okay? And then it makes a noise. That's why I say noise maker. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you some things to celebrate. I'm going to give you things, some things to rejoice about. And if we get to a point after I give you these 10 things where you think, you know what? We ought to celebrate this. We ought to rejoice about this. We ought to make some noise about this. Then, then do whatever comes naturally, all right? Hmm. Here's, here's what the Bible says in Psalm 150 as you're waiting to get your noisemaker. Praise the Lord with the sound of the trumpet, with the lute and harp, the timbrel and dance, stringed instruments and flutes, loud cymbals and clashing cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Okay, so when I say something that is something we should celebrate, I'm going to give you 10 reasons, okay? 
When I say something that you think we should make some noise about, you do what comes naturally. Here are 10 reasons that we can still rejoice. Number one, after 83 years, the Word of God still stands and still has all the answers. The Word of God still has all the answers. The Bible has... This is good. I like it. I love it when a plan comes together. Not one jot or tittle of this Bible, this book, this Word of God will ever pass away until it's all fulfilled. There's prophecies. The plan was after each point. You know, I've got ten points. But do whatever comes naturally to you. You can trust this book. I think we're going to have these every Sunday morning. Hallelujah. Okay. Number two, after 83 years, the prayers of God's people are still the most powerful force on the planet. Now, you toot and you make some noise but you weren't here at the last prayer meeting. <laughs> Once a month, we've got a prayer meeting for two hours on a Friday night. Next month, because it's a long weekend, we're holding it the second Friday. So I want you to come. It's Pentecostal. It's Holy Ghost filled. It's supernatural. It's prophetic. But it works when you come, and it don't work when you don't come. Do you know that God's will is only accomplished on the earth when his people pray? There's a, mm, there is a, there's a plan that God has. There's an anointing that God has. There's a revival that God has. There is a, 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 a system, a strategy. Think in heaven, do you know that heaven's got blueprints? Heaven's got plans? Heaven's got ideas. How does heaven's idea get manifested on earth? It's when God's people say and pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth just like it is in heaven. So we've got to pray. We've got to pray. Number three, after 83 years, the Holy Spirit still moves wherever there are hungry hearts. Let me ask you what the Holy Spirit moving means. It means some things happen. Now, I'm not suggesting we make something happen or we, or we fake something, but we ought to come to church every Sunday expecting something to happen, somebody to be saved, somebody to be healed, some life to be rearranged, some drug addict to be set free, some homosexual to be released from perversion, some alcoholic to be set free. Why? Because when the Spirit moves, things happen. Number four, after 83 years, God still honors the praise and worship of His people and responds with His presence and power. Okay, now listen. If we don't praise and we don't worship, God doesn't have an atmosphere to work in. He said, "Where I will inhabit the praises of my people. He never said, I'll inhabit the fear of my people. He didn't promise I'll inhabit the worry of my people. He didn't promise I'll inhabit the anxiety of my people. He said, I'll inhabit the praises 
of my people. You want more presence in your life? You want more power in your life? You ought to become a Pentecostal praiser and a worshiper. There God manifests his presence. And after 83 years, some things, how many, how many understand? Some things you've got to relearn. Some things you've got to retrain yourself on. So we're going to praise God and worship God and give him glory so that he can manifest his presence. Number five, after 83 years, there is still spirit-anointed preaching of the unchanging word of God. Whoa, somebody say yeah. Do you know that when somebody stands on the stage holds the Bible, and declares, Thus saith the Lord, we're pushing back the darkness. We're declaring the kingdom of God on this earth. We're declaring that Jesus is greater, that Jesus is alive, and that his word still prevails. Are you praying while the preacher preaches? Are you interceding as the preacher preaches? Are you saying, Oh God, let him have loose, let him, let, let him have liberty of speech, and let him have clarity of content? Let them have an anointing to get heaven's sword piercing our hearts this morning. You ought to pray every time someone's preaching here that the anointing is released. After 83 years, oh, this ought to bless you. There are still miracles, signs, and wonders as the Holy Spirit's being poured about on all flesh. The Bible says that the gospel was fully preached around all of Asia through signs and wonders. I thank God for every church that preaches the gospel, but this is a church that preaches the whole gospel, that Jesus has come to save you, to heal you, to baptize you with the Holy Ghost, to set you free from burdens and addictions and slavery, and to break everything off of your life that is not part of his kingdom. We are a house of miracles. We're a house of deliverance. We're a house of healing. So bring the sick with you. Bring the maimed with you. Bring the discouraged with you. And pray that God's anointing sets them free. Listen now. After 83 years, God is still supplying his children with their daily bread, meeting all their needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Oh, yeah. We could have a long list of testimonies this morning. People that have lived uh, more than a few years that have said, I've seen some troubled days. I've seen some hard days. I've seen some days I didn't know where, where, how I was going to eat next week. But God was faithful. God was with me. And God anointed my victory. God anointed the needs I had. God anointed my burden, and he lifted it, and he set me free. How many can testify this morning, God's been faithful through the years? Down through the decades, he's been good to his children. And I cannot tell you, I'm not prophesying one way or the other. I'm saying that in the future, we may have some hard times again. But if you will trust God, if you will serve God, if you'll obey God, you know what I'm doing now about troubled times to come? You know, you know what I'm doing? I'm tithing. I'm tithing. I take more than 10% off the top of everything that comes in my hands, and I plant it in my future. I invest it in the blessing of heaven because I know when the world is in need, and the world is in economic turmoil, and the world doesn't know how to get their next meal, God is going to send ravens to my house. God's going to send a, a gold coin in a fish's mouth. God's going to multiply manna down from heaven because he's faithful to those who remember him first. Yeah, I've just got 10 of these. If your lips are tired of blowing, just three more. After 83 years, the Spirit's anointing to break chains, set captives free, and deliver the oppressed is still in operation. Somebody say glory to God. My dad, <laughs> my dad one Friday night was a young pastor in Nova Scotia, Canada, and an alcoholic called him and said, Preacher, 
I need some help. And he went down to see the alcoholic. And the alcoholic said to him, I've tried everything. I can't, I'm going to take my life. I'm, I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm lost. I've lost my job, my family, my wife, my kids. Everything's gone. I don't know what to do. No one can help me. And my dad said to him, Jesus can help you and set you free tonight. He said, I don't know about that. And he said, Dad said, something happened in him. My father said, something rose in me, a rhema, a word of faith, a knowledge, an awareness, a revelation. And he said, out of my mouth came these words. He whom the Son sets free is free indeed. And if Jesus does not set you free tonight, I'll turn in my Bible and I will never preach again and I'll quit being a pastor. And something in the alcoholic said, what? My dad said, if Jesus does not set you free tonight. I'll hand in my Bible. I'll resign the church. I will never be a pastor or a preacher again because God lied. The alcoholic said, do you mean that? He said, I mean it. In the name of Jesus Christ, foul spirit of alcohol, come out of this life. And That man at that moment was instantly set free. Years later, a deacon in the church loving and serving God. Somebody say, the Holy Spirit still works. And you know what we need in this house? Some miracles like that. Some signs and wonders like that. Some power and evidence that Jesus is alive. Number nine, after 83 years, The Father still saves, redeems, rescues, and restores the lost when they call on the name of Jesus. There's nobody he can't save. There's nobody he can't redeem. There's nobody he can't rescue. There's nobody he can't restore. There's nobody but nobody but nobody that is too far gone for Jesus. I want every one of you right now to think about the worst heathen you know. I hope it's not your spouse. Okay, Think about the worst heathen you know. The one that is just gone beyond. The one that's just mocking God. The one that just doesn't even care anymore. That person is the person Jesus died to save. That person is available to open themselves up to say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. What you've got to do is get faith in your heart. See them right now. Pretend this is the back of their head. They're here worshiping God. They're they're crying out to God. You see them right now kneeling at this altar saying, Jesus, save me. See them. Can you see them right now? Do you know who you're thinking about? I pray you are. There's nobody but nobody but nobody that Jesus can't redeem. And this, I saved it for the last. After 83 years, Jesus Christ is still the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now stand up, put the noises aside, noisemakers down, as I tell you that there will never be another one like him. There'll never be anybody above him. There'll never be anybody beside him. Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father, and he's still in his church. He still wants to manifest himself. He still wants to show himself strong on behalf of those who love him. And he wants to make his church, listen, the absolute manifestation of his glory in this world. He wants us to care for one another. He wants us to watch each other, lift each other, encourage each other. But you know what he wants us to do? He wants us to encourage each other toward this, toward the truth. When your sister's discouraged... Don't just give her a cupcake. Give her a word from heaven. Give a cupcake too, but when your brother's down and, 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 and missing out, don't just take him out for coffee. Get a word from God. Say, brother, I, I care about you. You matter to me because you're part of the church. You're part of the family. Let me read that verse to you again. 
Now, all glory to God. All glory to God. You know what in the church? No flesh should glory in his presence. Because all glory goes to God. Through his mighty power at work within us. To accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. To him be glory in the church. By Christ Jesus. Through all generations. Forever and ever. How many have a computer in your home? Or on your phone? In your car? We got computers all around us. Do you know that just a few decades ago, IBM said, there's only going to be a need in the world for about five computers? (laughs) But a few young guys had a different idea. Steve Jobs was one of them. He had a different idea. He said, I see a, I see a, a, a computer in every home. What? I see a computer on your fridge. I see a computer in your house and in your hand. His apple was starting to grow, and he needed some, some professional help. So he, he thought the best guy in the world for growing his business worldwide was the vice president of Pepsi-Cola. So he had a meeting with him. He said, I want you to come on board. I want you to help me. He said, no, I'm not interested. Thank you. A month later, had another meeting. Offered him some more money. And he said, no, I'm just not interested. I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying my life here at Pepsi. A month later, he thought, how can I convince this man? He said, oh. He begged him. He said, I'm coming back to you. I want to talk to you one more time, and I'm going to offer you some more money. It's all the money we can offer you, but I just want five minutes. I want to ask you one question. He said, okay, next week. He came in. He put an offer on the table, slid it across him, and then he said these words to the vice president of Pepsi-Cola. Do you want to spend the rest of your life selling sugared water, or do you want to change the world? And that was what hooked him. He said, yeah, I think, I think I'd like to change the world. Do you know that the church of Jesus Christ is bigger than Apple? It's bigger than iPhones or computers. And you know what the enemy does with us? We get distracted with sugared water. We get distracted by life and busyness and stuff. Not bad, not evil. I like a Diet Pepsi. I'm sorry, Valerie. I like a Diet Pepsi once once in a while. Not evil. Just doesn't change the world. You know, what we have to do again this morning on this 83rd anniversary is say, God, I'm signing up once again. Holy Spirit, here's my life. I'm signing up because I still believe that the church is the greatest thing on the planet right now. This church, the greatest thing on the planet. I'm excited about the Walmart neighborhood store coming here and new restaurants right next door. I'm excited. But the church on this section is more important than that. The church of Jesus Christ is established so that Jesus might be glorified. What can I do to be a building stone, a living stone in the church of Jesus Christ? On this 83rd anniversary Sunday, would you come just for five minutes at this altar, lift your hand to heaven and say, I still believe Jesus.